gears a little bit. Um, talk about, I guess, um, maybe fair to call it an emerging crop, a uh, giant miscanthus. You might have heard it kind of being talked about a little bit recently, some uh, talk at crop school and elsewhere. So we're going to talk just a little bit about production uh, and fertility related to giant miscanthus. Let's see. All right. So starting off, kind of what is it? Well, it's a warm season uh, perennial grass. Um, and it's a, it's a naturally occurring hybrid of two other species of Miscanthus. So you can see pictures of those there, Miscanthus sinensis, um, which you'll, you'll actually, you see pretty commonly around as an ornamental crop. Um, and then Miscanthus uh, sacrifloris, um, which, is, which is another ornamental, and that one actually has some concerns um, about it spreading kind of into roadsides and ditches and whatnot. Um, but that's not as much of a concern with giant Miscanthus. Uh, given that it, it's, it's a sterile hybrid. Um, so it's a, it's a triploid species, meaning um, basically it has an extra set of chromosomes. So the seed that's produced actually isn't viable. So it can't, it can't actually be propagated by seeds. Um, so that's kind of a drawback when it comes to getting it established, um, but it's good as far as kind of uh, from an invasive management perspective or, or managing the spread. Um, so like I said, it's, it's generally propagated by rhizome division. Um, and these are some pictures here of the rhizomes. Uh, you can see kind of the first one on the left there with, with some, uh, some shoots kind of coming off of there. And then the right one is, is kind of dried out. You can kind of see it has kind of a woody structure um, when, it's, when it's dried off. And so this rhizome will basically, you know, you'll have shoots coming um, you know, up you know, out of the ground and then, and then roots also coming, uh, growing off of that rhizome. And so this can also be, miscanthus can also be uh, propagated with plugs, with small plants, um, but that's generally kind of a, a, more, a more expensive way of, uh, of getting it established. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty impressive crop. Um, you know, you can see in the picture it growing next to uh, sunflowers and corn and it, it'll get up to around 12 feet tall once it's, uh, once it's fully established. And it's also fairly deep rooted. So those roots are getting down um, around eight or eight or more feet. And so once you get that successful establishment, um, it's, a, it's a good biomass crop because it can maintain production for, for quite a long time, you know, up to 15 to 20 years, uh, maybe, even, maybe even a little bit longer. And so you can kind of see as, a, as you see it growing throughout the season. So this would be kind of earlier on in the summer, once it kind of gets to that, that max height, you know, that's, that's probably up around 10 to 12 feet right there. Um, a little bit later in the season, um, you can see it's it's kind of starts to dry out. We see it flowering. Um, so this would probably, I'm not sure exactly the timing of that picture, but that's probably sometime in the fall, uh, maybe the early fall. And then you can see it kind of in the winter, uh, pre-harvest, where it's uh, it's lost some of its leaves. Um, it's, it's dried down substantially. Um, and it typically is looking like this um, in most cases uh, when it's when it's harvested. So just kind of a little history about, about giant miscanthus. It, it has been around for a while. Um, it's, a, it's a native uh, plant to Asia, but it was imported to Europe uh, way back in the 30s. And, and so it was, it was cultivated um, a little bit, uh, you know, throughout the early 1900s. Um, around the 80s, there was some, some new interest in Europe um, as a biomass crop for biofuels. So there was, there was kind of some renewed interest in Europe. And we can kind of see as we got closer into the, the early 2000s, um, we, we saw some more interest in the states um, and some, some field trials were started and uh, some, some private sector investments. So that interest um, has, really, has really just been growing um, over the last you know, 15 to 20 years or so. Um, so, so getting the crop established, it's, uh, it's generally recommended to plant in the spring, although I think there, there has been some, some fall planting going on. Um, you know, to, to get a good establishment, uh, you want to have a good seed bed prepared. Um, you want good soil contact for those rhizomes um, to, to get established well. And moisture is also critical for that establishment. Um, I'd say it's probably unlikely we're going to be seeing a lot of miscanthus on irrigated fields. So, I mean, obviously this is subject to the weather, um, but we do want to try to make sure um, as best we can to have adequate moisture uh, as we're getting that, that crop planted. And ideally, 
Um, once it's established, it'd be good to, to, to reach a um, establishment of about 6,000 plants per acre. So that planting rate is probably a little bit higher than that. Um, what I've seen referenced is about 30 inches within the rows and then 30 inches spacing of the rows. Um, and that works out to about 7,000 plants per acre. And so if you account for a little bit of loss, hopefully that'll help you achieve that, that 6,000 plant per acre um, rate. And just over there in the picture, that's, um, I believe that's kind of a specialized planter that's been developed uh, for miscanthus, uh, planting miscanthus rhizomes specifically. Um, it, it kind of a little bit similar to a potato planter, but I don't think there's been as much success with a potato planter, but I, I believe this one in particular was developed um, by Agrotech, which is a you know company you might have heard of in the region that's that's uh, been getting a fair amount of miscanthus in the ground the past few years. Now, as far as um, fertility for establishment, um, you do want to, to fertilize your P and K, um, you know, based on your soil test. So, trying to get those into into optimum ranges pre-plant is ideal. And obviously, if uh, if lime is necessary, uh, applying that uh, the previous fall. And as far as it's got a pretty wide uh, range of, of pH that it can handle, five and a half to seven and a half. So kind of the the target target pH is you know that that six and a half to seven range. What we'll see for a lot of um, agronomic crops. As far as the establishment period, um, nitrogen isn't recommended um, for a couple of reasons. And one is that, um, you know, in, in going through the literature of, of miscanthus fertility, there really isn't a yield benefit seen during that establish, uh, establishment period uh, for nitrogen. And secondly, um, that application may further increase your weed pressure. So, um, you know, managing the weeds is an important part of, of getting a good established crop. Um, because basically if weeds start to take over and kind of block out the light for that, uh, for those new shoots, then it has trouble getting established. Um, so, you know, an herbicide program is necessary, but hopefully with, uh, without applying that nitrogen, that'll help to, you know, decrease your, your fertilizer costs and, and, and potentially um, decrease kind of some costs associated with your, with your herbicide program. Now, as far as kind of organic nutrient sources, uh, manure, biosolids, et cetera, um, we, we do have kind of an exemption work through, through MDA so that if, if you do have a, a P or K need um, for your establishment, you can use you know, manure or, or biosolids or something like that at a P or a K-based rate um, to, be, to meet that recommendation. Um, but that would be, that would be capped at, at either that P or K based rate or 50 pounds of, of plant available nitrogen per acre, kind of whichever one um, you hit first. And so just kind of seeing how, you know, how it gets established. So this is just a little miscanthus plot um, that, that was about one year old. So it's kind of still in that, in, uh, that establishment time frame, And you can see kind of in the circles, there's still a fair amount of new shoots uh, you know, coming up through the ground um, a year, uh, you know, over a year after it was actually planted. So it's still, still kind of in that establishment period. Uh, so as far as kind of the, the maintenance period for the crop, um, the full yield potential really isn't, isn't gonna be reached until at least that third year. And again, that kind of goes back to, to giving it the time to get those rhizomes, you know, established in the soil um, and, and produce, um, produce enough shoots. And so the, the yield potential kind of once you hit that, it's, it's kind of a, a wide range referenced in the literature. Um, you know, seeing yields anywhere from eight to 15 tons, tons of dry matter per acre. Um, I think what I've seen on, on sandier soils that may be more comparable to, to what we're seeing on the Eastern shore is a little bit in the lower range of that, maybe more like eight to 10 or eight to 12 tons per acre. Um, but out in the Midwest, um, they definitely have seen some yields higher than that, but I don't know if that's, that's kind of within the range, but we'll see at least on the Delmarva. Uh, one of the places where this, um, you know, this, this crop is, is particularly efficient um, is, is recycling nutrients between the above ground and below ground biomass. And that's kind of shown in the, um, uh, over on the left here, where, uh, you know, in the fall, in the winter, 
the nutrients that have kind of accumulated in that above ground biomass will start to translocate and move back into the rhizomes because we saw those are kind of woody structures um, and they kind of serve as storage structures uh, for some of those nutrients. And then in the spring after it's been harvested and as new shoots are, are regrowing, um, those nutrients can, can move back from the rhizomes and to feed those growing shoots. So it kind of helps it to be a, uh, a cost efficient crop um, and kind of uh, keep, um, uh, keep your, your nutrient costs uh, at a minimum. Now I mentioned in the fall uh, that, that some of the leaves drop. So that's further gonna recycle some nutrients um, if it's not harvested prior to that. Although we do see um, you know, a potential yield decrease from that. But it kind of depends on your end use. Um, there are a fair amount of end uses that actually prefer that dried down, uh, that dried down uh, uh, biomass rather than uh, being wet uh, prior to uh, when those leaves drop. And it also helps to, to build up soil organic matter, um, which, is, which is definitely uh, something that's, that's good for our Eastern shore soils. And so as a general recommendation, we'll get into more details on kind of what this works out to, um, but since it's, it's efficient like this, uh, we generally look at, at matching, matching our fertilizer recommendation or fertilizer applications uh, to what we're actually removing uh, by the crop. And so kind of when we get to that harvest period, um, again, it's typically harvested in, in late winter, early spring, and we can kind of see a picture of what the crop looks like at that time period. We can see those leaves on the ground. Um, it's, it's, the reeds are, are fairly dry. And, but there is some interest in, in, some, in some fall harvests. Um, kind of before the leaf drop, as we mentioned, there, there might be some potential high, potentially higher yields there, um, but we're also going to have higher nutrient removal because again, that, that fall and early winter period is kind of when we see a lot of those nutrients moving back into the rhizomes. So if we harvest kind of before that, then we have you know, higher, higher removal, um, which again would lead to, to higher, higher crop inputs needed. So again, going back to that concept of, of kind of applying the NPK to match the crop removal, well, what are we looking at for crop removal? You know, these are, there's a wide range in the literature, but these were kind of the, the, the best estimates um, that were out there considering all of that data. So about 10 pounds of nitrogen uh, per ton of dry matter removed, about two pounds of phosphate per ton. And then that, that actually close to doubles um, if we look at a fall harvest and about 17 pounds of potash. Um, and that increases a little bit for a fall harvest where again, those nutrients haven't completely translocated. And so what does that look like for about an eight ton per acre yield? It's about 80 pounds of nitrogen, about 20 pounds of phosphate, about 135 pounds of potash. And again, those would be slightly further adjusted. If your P and K are already in the optimum or high levels, um, then we might not recommend uh, applying more. And so just kind of a, a look at what the, the harvest looks like. It's, it's fairly similar to a, uh, uh, to a silage harvest. Um, I believe the, the, the harvester on the right there is kind of a mod modified silage harvester. Um, but in general, this is kind of what it looks like in the, in, at least in the winter period. Um, and again, this can, be, this can be beneficial as far as a, a timing um, if, if this is something you're kind of working in with a, with a corn soybean rotation, um, this harvest kind of in the, in the late winter, so we're talking like the February, March timeframe, um, there might be less field activities going on with other crops during this time. Um, so it, it might be a, a beneficial uh, crop in that sense. Now, there, there also has been some, some interest in some two cut harvest systems. So again, kind of looking at more of like the, the green harvest before it fully dries down um, and then splitting that into two harvests, uh, maybe one earlier in the, or later in the spring, early summer, and then again in the fall. But at least this, you know, one study did look at this, this system in particular um, and they really didn't see a yield benefit um, from doing that. So you can kind of see, see in those graphs there 
um, where the numbers kind of indicate significant, or the letters, excuse me, indicate significant differences in yield uh, between the, the different harvest systems. And kind of in general, they didn't really see any, any yield benefit to that uh, between two cuttings versus just a single cutting um, in October. So again, kind of thinking along the lines of, of this being a cost effective crop, um, it may not be beneficial to, to spend the money to, to you know, have another pass in the field with a harvester. Uh, just some other, other considerations uh, during production. Um, water availability is likely the most constraining factor in production. Um, but there may also be some, some drought tolerance associated uh, with, with Mithcansis. There's, there's probably going to be a yield hit in a drought year. Um, but it has been shown to be, to be a pretty resilient crop um, where it, it kind of does, it does kind of bounce back uh, once that adequate rainfall is, um, is provided to it. And as far as, um, you know, regions, you know, Maryland is, is, you know, gets plenty of rainfall as far as uh, what miscanthus needs. Generally, it's not recommended um, for regions that get less than 30 inches of rainfall per year. Um, and obviously in Maryland, we're, you know, averaging around, uh, you know, 40 inches or so on average. Um, so generally, we're getting enough rainfall here to, uh, to support growing miscanthus. Now, excessive moisture, there's some indication, this really isn't, isn't published literature, but it was uh, just in communication, um, that it might be able to handle some, some excessive moisture um, and again, be resilient um, in situations. And you can see that picture on the right there was from a, a, you know, a, pretty, a pretty wet field um, that's still, still putting out some, some new shoots. As far as uh, pests and disease, there aren't really any, any known issues as of yet. Um, there's some indication that, that miscanthus might be a host for sugarcane aphid, um, which we, you know, is, is more of a major crop for, uh, uh, for sorghum in the, the southern United States. And we, we see it in Maryland a little bit uh, late season on sorghum. Um, but even if it has been found as a host, there hasn't, there hasn't been any uh, economic damages um, as of yet. Now, I mentioned early on, just kind of touched upon the invasive potential. Um, the giant miscanthus particularly is considered non-invasive. And again, that kind of is owed to the fact that it doesn't produce viable seed. Um, so it's not going to be spreading, uh, you know, via, via the seed that's produced. Um, but there are some, some recommendations, some best practices um, for limiting unintentional spread, or I guess, you know, we can kind of call that creep. Um, you know, the, the, the crop kind of slowly spreading maybe outside of its um, field borders. So, you know, to kind of, you know, limit some of that, some of the best practices, making sure you're containing any rhizomes uh, during transport so those don't get, you know, unintentionally spread. Um, also, one of the recommendations is to maintain a 25, that should say feet, excuse me, a 25 foot setback surrounding the miscanthus stand if the neighboring ground is not managed by the grower. Because obviously if that, if that ground is managed by the grower and another crop, you know, they're gonna be managing that not to spread into their other crop otherwise. Um, but if you don't manage that surround that neighboring ground, um, then it's recommended to have that set back to, to uh, keep an eye on any, any potential, uh, potential spread. And then if you have excess planting stock, you know, making sure that's properly disposed of, you know, it's pretty straightforward and making sure any, any residues are, are clean from, from your equipment. So as far as the end uses, um, you know, most often throughout uh, the United States and Europe, it's, it's mostly grown as a, as a biomass crop for, for bioenergy or as a biofuel. Um, but we've seen, we've seen locally kind of an alternative market um, as, a, as a bedding material, particularly for the, for the poultry industry. So you can kind of see some pictures of what that, what that material kind of looks like um, as, an, as an end use. And again, going back to thinking about harvest timing, um, the, the, when it's harvested in the winter, kind of after it's natural dry down um, is, is kind of a good attribute for the bedding material. So there, um, although there's, there's kind of that, that decrease in yield, again, there's, there should be some consideration to what that end use is 
and kind of what the best practice as far as harvest is related to that. And there's just another another picture of that that bedding material um, with some with some reference in there. And there are some other potential uses um, that are being explored out there. Um, things like windbreaks, um, having some some products for erosion control, so like uh, filling for socks and waddles. Um, there's also some interest as a hydro mulch, and then also into uh, compostable fibers. And so this this picture here is actually where the the, the product's been baled um, after being harvested, and that baled product is what's being kind of explored as an alternative use to kind of um, replace replace things like uh, styrofoam for the food industry or things like that. So, so there's, there's potential for other things. I think the biggest market we're seeing right now is for the, uh, for the poultry industry. And there's, you know, obviously we don't want, I don't think they want everybody planting all their fields in Miscanthus. So it's not kind of uh, saturate that, that market, but there's, there's potential for some, for maybe some other alternative markets as well. And so just real quick, um, you know, for some more details on the, on the uh, fertility requirements, um, you can reference this fact sheet, which, which has been published and posted online. Um, we're also, you'll find out probably in the next talk that, that we do have um, these recommendations worked into uh, Newman 5.1, which will hopefully be released in the near future. Um, but for the meantime, if you're looking to put together recommendations for a nutrient management plan, um, you can again reference those recommendations in here. So hopefully I didn't try to rush through that too much, but I did try to go quick. So um, that's all I got and we'll, we'll take questions, I guess, whenever, whenever we got the time. Uh, yeah, Brian, we have a, a lot of material to cover yet and we need to get Paul Shipley started. So um, uh, Brian, would you check the chat box? There were a couple of questions. I think you're, I think you answered a couple of them, but there was a question about the economics. Uh, so maybe you can do that. So uh, uh, let's, uh, but thank you very much. And let's just move right away to Paul Shipley so we can get everything worked in here. Thank you, Dwight. Let me uh, pull my screens up here. <clears throat> 